um, remain standing. Remain standing for a little bit. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take our Bible reading for this morning. Um, good morning to you all, and welcome, welcome back to King City Church. We're so, so excited to have you here. Um, this is February, and as you know, in the culture, uh, it's what we are celebrating, particularly here in the United States and in, in the West and Canada as well, a Black History Month. And as we discussed last week Sunday, one of the things that we feel that God has called us to do is to have an awareness of what's happening in culture and be able to speak from Scripture through a gospel-centered lens to what's happening in our culture today. So in honor of uh, Black History Month, we're going to be going into a new series this month, and it's going to be the series of Joseph and his brothers, a story that all of us know. Joseph and his brothers, and we're going to be taking our text from Genesis chapter 37, Genesis chapter 37, and this is a, again a text that all of us know, and we read it in our children's storybooks, and um, we've seen it in our Disney movies, but from a different lens, we're going to be taking a look at Joseph and his brothers, and seeing how... Uh, this story applies to us in the here and now, particularly in the honor of uh, Black History Month. So, Genesis chapter 37, please stand for the reading of God's word. Um, I'm going to be reading from verses 2 to 5, and then after that from 18 to 28. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wife, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. And they couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. I'm going to skip to verse 18. In between this is how uh, Joseph has this dream and uh, he interprets this dream for them. And uh, it leads to more hatred. And verse 18, which is going to be the subject for our conversation today and next week, Joseph gets sold into slavery. In verse 18, when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance, and as they approached them, he made, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him to one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him, and then we can see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben had heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him to this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him to the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming towards them. It was a group of Israelite traders taking a load of gum and balm and aromatic resin from Gilead from down to Egypt. Then Judah said to her brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'll have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to these Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our flesh, and our blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Mediate traders, came by, Joseph pulled Joseph's brothers pulled him up out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him 
to Egypt. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're so grateful. Honored that we could be in your presence once again as a community, as a family. Father, we ask that even as we go into your word this morning, that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to us, transform us, unite us. We ask this in Jesus' name, and amen. amen. Please be seated in God's presence. Good morning, good morning. Welcome again. I'm so um, honored and excited that you are all here this morning, and as you mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, we are in the month of February, and February is a month that, as we know, the culture here in the United States, and even in some parts of Canada, we honor Black History Month. If anyone is wondering why, why, why talk about Black History Month, we'll get there in a second, but even just this week, we've seen how the issue of race in our country still remains something that's very sensitive. This week, Whoopi Goldberg got suspended from The View for some of the comments and remarks she made in respect to the Holocaust. Uh, she has said that the Holocaust wasn't about race, and Whoopi Goldberg, too, an icon, got suspended from The View. I was pretty shocked to see that, but again, we know um, how sensitive that issue is. And then again, after that, we saw that the former Miami Dolphins uh, Miami Dolphins NFL coach Brian Flores filed a class action lawsuit against the NFL um, and his teams, this is on Tuesday, alleging that they were engaged in discriminatory practices against hiring black candidates. If anyone understands that there's a, a rule called the Rooney Rule, basically that says that you have to interview uh, a person of color uh, for these jobs in the NFL because historically um, there's been a challenge with getting, you know, black coaches or people of color into those roles, into those coaching positions. So, point is, the issue of race still remains a sensitive issue in our culture. And that's the reason why I find it interesting when people ask, so why talk about, why, why Black History Month? You know, what's the point of bringing this up? Doesn't this happen decades ago, centuries ago? And we want to be clear that we as a church, we believe in the idea that, you know, God is calling all nations, all peoples, all ethnic groups to come together. That the kingdom of God looks like a diverse group of people coming together. So this is not a session where we're going to talk about um, division of any way and any kind. But in the same vein, we still must honor the fact that despite the fact God calls us, to come together as one kingdom, one family, and that from the very beginning of scripture, he has called that Jesus was going to reach and save every nation, every tribe, and he's called us as a church to reach the, every nation, every tribe. The bottom line is that we're still distinct in various ways. In Revelation chapter seven, verse nine to 10, it said this, this is the end of history of when everyone comes together. It says, after this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, which no one could number, standing before the throne of the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hand, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. This is when history ends, where we all come together. The bottom line is, every nation, every tribe, everyone will come together in the end of history. But, if you notice, even then, we will be, despite united, still distinct, we'll still be able to recognize our distinctiveness. In other words, what this means is that when we call for unity and we call for harmony, it doesn't necessarily mean that we call for a doing away of our distinct ethnic groups or doing away of our distinct races. We ought to celebrate every race, every tongue, every tribe in unity despite our distinction. Does that make sense? Because the challenge sometimes is that in the call for unity, sometimes it makes it seem then that we should do away with our distinctions. We should just not acknowledge the fact that we all have our differences. We may have and we may have heard some people who are well intentioned say, I don't see any color. And as, and as well intentional that may sound, we are different. But not in a bad way, in a good thing. It's a good thing we ought to celebrate our differences. So in other words, we ought to be excited about the fact that we can celebrate the history of black people, particularly here in this country. 
And so Black History Month essentially is an annual celebration designated in the month of February where we celebrate the achievements of African Americans for their, their time in this country and for recognizing the role that African Americans played in U.S. history. This started in 1976 um, where uh, the president at the time, I think with Gerald Ford, you know, ensured that every, it grew out of ne Negro History Week into uh, a Black History Month. And now all over the world, United States, Canada, and even some parts of the United Kingdom devote a month to celebrating Black History Month. So this month, we're going to be looking at that history. We're going to be looking at that story and saying to ourselves, how then can this Bible speak to us in the context of where God is leading us to, how does the gospel inform us as to have to deal in and, and, and teasing out this history? How do we look at the lens, through the lens of scripture, and be able to offer healing and reconciliation in a world that is still divisive? How do we treat the issues of slavery and its history, injustice, oppression? How does the Bible speak to all of that? And so with that said, when we look into the history, particularly of, of people of color in this country, um, there is a constant tension, particularly when it has to do with being a person of color, at the same time being Christian. And unfortunately, there has been some tension because of the history somehow of where people think Christianity originated from. A quote by Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad is one of the Nation of Islam's leaders. This is his quote, and, and I think a very divisive comment, but this is one of the reasons why we're seeing some defection, if you will, and even people of color from the Christian faith because of their hearing these kind of like, you know, quotes. It says, the so-called Negro must awaken before it's too late. They think that the white man's Christianity will save them regardless of what happens, they, and they are gravely mistaken. They must know that the white man's religion is not from God or from Jesus or any other prophet. What a divisive comment. And so essentially he's trying to tell us that as believers, we ought not to be because this is a quote unquote white man's religion. And so because of the distrust that you know, some in the black community have felt, because of all that's happened in, in history, some black people hear those kind of things and say, you know what, we don't want to have anything to do with Christianity. We don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. We don't want to have anything to do with that faith because it's the faith that's been associated with, um, the faith that's been associated somehow with slavery and, and, and the white missionaries coming to Africa and, and, and doing all these things, so to speak. But is that true? Is it that Christianity originated in Europe or it became something where the, the, uh, the missionaries that came to Africa used as a ploy to, 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 to kidnap Africans to the Americas? Is that true? Is that where Christianity came from? And the answer is no. Long, long, long before the barbaric transatlantic slave trade that happened in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, Christianity and the faith of Christianity had taken root in Africa. And one of the things you want to highlight this month and even in the weeks to come is showing how Africans have always been, and by Africans I mean before the diaspora and all the trade that, the trade that happened, have always been in the picture of God, always. Has always been the plan and purpose of God. Did you know that John Mark, yes, Mark's gospel, the one that we read, the second gospel of the New Testament, he was born in Libya, which is considered Northern Africa. John Mark was the one who um, was the cousin of Barnabas and went on several missionary journeys with Paul. And he wrote the second gospel of the Bible. That's John Mark. How about Origen? Origen is one of the most well-renowned 
you know, not considered a church father per se, but one of the most brilliant theologians of time, and he originated from Alexandria in Egypt. And then Tertullian. Tertullian is also known as one of these early church fathers. But again, when I say the word church father, I, I say that in context because there's, in history, there are four that people recognize as early church fathers. But Tertullian was also African. He was, again, he's a northern African country from the country of Tunisia, which is now known as modern day Tunisia. You know the doctrine of Trinity, where even though Trinity is not necessarily in the Bible, but the idea that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the three had and one, it was Tertullian that came up with this theology, parsing it from Scripture. And then St. Augustine, he, by, by all historical accounts, is known after Paul to be the greatest theologian of the New Testament, of the New Testament times since the early church, and originates from modern-day Algeria. These are all northern African countries, and these are all African men demonstrating the fact that Africans have always been used by God for his plan and purpose. And so this is an apologetic, if you will, to put to rest the idea then that somehow, some way, that Africans and Christianity and, and slavery are all mixed up. No, that's not true. That's not the truth. While slavery in our country caused a lot of problems is the reason why we have so much distrust between Christianity and the Christian faith and, and um, where we are today. So the bottom line is, before we go into our text, I just want to just sort of address that really quickly, and I hope that all of you all get that and can begin to share that with anyone else who may have any kind of contention or confusion with this, is that Christianity first started in Jerusalem. And then from Jerusalem, it spread to Africa first. And then from Africa to Rome and Europe. And so well before Christendom formed in Rome in the 300, you know, like 300 AD, like the third century, Christianity's headquarters was in Alexandria, Egypt. This is where you see, you know, uh, John Mark and Origen, all these scholars and theologians, they came from Alexandria, Egypt. Matter of fact, Apollos. Apollos, who we, we speak of in the New Testament in Acts, who was this brilliant scholar who needed to get his theology right by Paul and, and Priscilla and Aquila. These were African Jews. African Jews. As a matter of fact, in the birth of the early church in Acts chapter 2, I don't have time to go into it this morning, but when the Pentecost happened, the Bible said that people from Jews from all over the world came. And part of that world was Cyrene and in Libya. Africans from all over the world came to witness the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 13, when the, the first church plan and missionary group was put together, it was five men. And Simon, of, also called Niger, or the black man, was one of those people. He was from Libya. This, so the Bible is clear that from the origins of Scripture, from the very, very beginning, people of color have always been involved in the plan and purpose of God. And so, since that time till now, we've seen Christianity spread all over the world, all over the world. And matter of fact, there's a book, I can't go into all detail this morning, but it talks about how when you look at all the major religions of the world, you can look at the major religions and they stay primarily in that region. For example, when you look at Islam, find out where Islam originated from. To this day, Saudi Arabia, Mecca, that area is where the vast majority of the Muslims are. When you look at the, the religion of Hinduism, the same thing with India, where it's Buddhism and Confucianism, the major participants or adherents to that religion, they stay there. But Christianity is the one religion, or the one faith, if you will, that despite its inception in Jerusalem has spread all over the world. And so therefore, Christianity has become the most multiracial, multi-ethnic, multicultural movement in all of history. In all of history. And so now when you look at all the different parts of the world, you have like maybe 25% of Christians are in Europe, 
maybe another 25% of Christians are in Africa, and that number is growing. And then maybe another 25% of Christians are in, in, uh, in Asia, in China. Again, that number is growing. In another 25 years, the majority of Christians would not be in the West. In 2050, Asia, with China, and all these other countries is exploding in Latin America. The faith has moved. And so the faith that we adhere to, the faith that incorporates all people, all people from all over the world. But if that is true, and it is, why do this trust, why do we have so many people of color having some sort of tension with the faith? Why do we have people like even the black Hebrew movements also up and running who are contending against the faith, it's telling us that no, we should not as people of color adhere to Christianity because of all the issues that have to do with Christianity. And the truth of the matter is this. There was a moment where Christians, Christians turn a blind eye when things were wrong. There was a moment in our history where Christians participated in the transatlantic slave trade and endorsed slavery. There was a moment in our country where we decided to stay silent when slaves were being abused. And yes, there was moments where not only did we stay silent, we used the very same scripture to justify keeping people of color in chains. I mean, doesn't the Bible say slaves obey your masters? They said. Even in the civil rights era, and this is not applicable to all, but because we have people even here in our, our midst who were part of the civil rights movement at some point and they're not even people and they're, and they're um, not even um, black folks, if you will, but the people who that they quiet. And even up until recent times, we see that when people of color are crying for, um, for justice, the church oftentimes stays silent. And so yes, the, the tension is real. And yes, the distrust can be justified in some context. So let's look into our text for this morning. But the question I want to ask us then is this. For between this week and next week, we're going to look at this particular text and address this question. And I want all of you all to be, to be to leave with a more biblical, robust understanding so that you can serve as an apologist, if you will, when these kind of questions come at you in the culture. Does the Bible endorse slavery? Did the Bible endorse slavery? Is there anywhere in scripture where the Bible says, thou shalt not enslave another? Genesis chapter 37 is where we find ourselves. This text we see Joseph, who is, is sold into slavery by his own brothers. Next week we're going to teach us out a little bit more and the implication of that for our own times. Because here we have in our midst, People who are first generation African immigrants, second generation African Americans, African Americans, we have white Americans, we have a good mix here that we can actually go in a little deeper as to implications. Because if we look into history, and this is one attention that we have together, even as people of color of African American descent and, and African descent, we look at each other and we have to destruct them. We say, ah, your forefathers sold us into slavery. And they say, well, we were in there. Why should we blame for this? And then we have this tension that still exists to this day. And what we said about our vision and who we are is that God, by his spirit, will unite us in a way that we resemble the kingdom of God so that we can be a people that looks to the culture and says to the people, look at what the spirit of God has done within us to bring us together despite the issue, despite the flaws, despite the pain, and then embody that kingdom to a culture that's watching and be able to point to our king who united us all together. But before we go into the story of Joseph and how he sold him to slavery, do you know that this is not actually the first story or the first instant 
or mention of slavery in Scripture. The first slave actually we see in Scripture is not Joseph, but Hagar. Hagar. And so when we look into the story of Hagar, Hagar, by the way, was a slave girl of Sarah. Anybody know this story? Raise your hands. Ah, we got a lot of church people in the house. She was a slave of Sarah. By the way, Sarah is Egyptian. I'm sorry, Hagar is Egyptian. I'm sorry. Hagar is Egyptian. <laughs> Hagar is Egyptian. And Abraham and Sarah are infertile. God makes a promise to Abraham that Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you a father of many nations. But Abraham fails to trust in God. And he takes matter in his own hands. And he did what was okay in the culture at the time. Sarah says, hey, take my slave, take my handmaid, take my girl. You have sex with her and have a baby by her. And by the way, when you have the baby by her, that baby becomes mine. And so evidently, Abraham listens, like most men probably would have, and gets Hagar pregnant. She conceives and bears a name, bears a son by the name Ishmael. Ishmael, I want you to, again, remember that name. Because if you remember, if you remember the Ishmaelites in Genesis chapter 37 is who Joseph will be slow to in slavery. Ishmael was who Hagar had as her son. And so when we look into that first thing, we, we, all of a sudden we're, dis, we're, we're disappointed because it almost appears then that the Bible is okay with this. I mean, was, what was, God, was God okay with the idea that, that Abraham would sleep with his slave girl and, and have a baby by her? Why did he get punished? Isn't he the patriarch? And this is what leads us into actual verse 30, chapter 37 and verse 2. Chapter 37 and verse 2. And it said, this is the account of Jacob and his family. There's Abraham. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob and Esau. And this is the account of Jacob's family and his 12 sons. Joseph is the 11th son born by the woman he loves, Rachel. Rachel had a slave girl. Guess what? Leah had a slave girl. They had slave girls, and guess what their names were? Bilhah and Zilpah. So then, Joseph was 17 years old when he tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, half-brothers, who were the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. So right here we see again, the sons of the woman who were enslaved, who were used as pawns and Leah and Rachel's issues are mad at the fact that Joseph is the loved one. He's the one who gets the beautiful robe. He's the one who gets the father's love. While when you read this, on one end, you say, oh, man, these guys were jealous, they're envious. Oh, they're thinking, selling the book to Satan, but jeez, can you blame them? Look at them. They're the ones who don't get the Father's love. They're the ones who don't get the love. They're the ones who are left to the side. And Joseph, of nothing of he done himself, gets the Father's love. And he gets the robe to demonstrate the fact that Joseph was going to inherit Jacob's majority possession. Because what that robe signified was a, was, a, was a signified inheritance. And so then, the favoritism towards Joseph, it only inflamed the insecurities of these brothers and the hatred of their brother Joseph. And look at the dysfunction of this family. Look at the dysfunction. Isaac, Joseph's grandfather, would do the same thing to his father. Isaac had two sons. He had Esau and he had Jacob. Isaac loved Esau. Rebecca, his mother, loved Jacob. Favoritism. And this is a message for another day. <laughs> With the kids. Every so now that I ask my parents, do you have any favorites? Who are your favorite? Who's your favorite son? Who's your favorite daughter? We don't have any favorites. 
wise, wise answer. <laughs> the dysfunction is clear. Isaac favors Esau. Jacob is not favored. He's favored by his mom. That favoritism causes problems in the household where Jacob had to go on a run. He never sees his parents again. He never sees his parents again after they, um, they move. And then he comes down, and now he's doing the exact same thing. He favors one son over the others. Why? Because he loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. Leah was the wife he didn't want. And so because of that, now he has a son, and he's loving and demonstrating love towards his son with the same love he has for his wife. And that's another conversation for another day. How fathers and men treat their children based off the relationship they have with their wives or lack thereof of the relationship they have with their wives. This is a dysfunctional family. Abraham, with them sleeping with his slave girls, and Jacob and Esau with the favoritism and the tricks that they play on each other, still each other's birthright, and now they're here, and now you're seeing Jacob favoring his sons. Now Joseph is favored and he is in trouble and his other brothers are neglected, deprived of a father's love that they need, but they, just, they, they don't have. And now they're hateful. Now they're envious and now they're jealous. And on one end you're saying, my gosh, can you blame them? But again, again, guys, this is where the gospel shines brightly. This is the family that God chose. This is the family that God would choose to bring Jesus who would now be a blessing to all the nations. This family. Even the patriarch didn't get it right. And so to segue from what the subject of this morning is, I don't know if there's anyone here who's saying, listen, I, I've made several mistakes. I've, I've, I've slept with people I shouldn't have slept with. I've, I've sinned. I've, I've, I've had children, you know, with people I, you know, I've done whatever it is that you've done. The gospel is. We're not saved by our works. The gospel is. We're not saved by our perfection. The gospel is that Jesus comes to earth for you and I, that despite our mess, despite our sin, he comes in and he swoops in and he saves us by his grace, by his works on the cross, not ours. So Abraham was chosen, and this family was chosen, not because they were perfect, but clearly they weren't. They were chosen because God is gracious. God is good. He was chosen because God is a good God. And that's the message for us today, that no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done, by placing faith in Christ, he will forgive, he will have mercy, because we're saved not by our works that any man should boast, but by the grace of God. And can I get an amen on that? Amen. <laughs> But Joseph is sold to the Israelite traders. And, and, and when you, again, if you think about it, Hagar was the mother of Ishmael. And now they've had many children. And by the way, the Bible prophesies and tells Hagar in Genesis chapter 16 that she would have a prosperous generation, that she would, her, her, her descendants shall be plenty. And Ishmael became a very, very mighty man indeed, a mighty nation. And this is where, again, I want us to remember, again, this, remember this Sunday is really about a, an apologetics, if you will, for, for the Bible in itself. That while we see slavery in Scripture, this is not an endorsement of it. And can we point to that by looking at this narrative, what the differences are between the ancient slavery and modern day slavery and its incarnations. When you look at this fact that on one end a Hebrew man Abraham enslaved an Egyptian woman Hagar but now when we flip to Genesis chapter 37 a Hebrew boy is being enslaved by an Egyptian or rather the Ishmael Ishmaelite people and sold into slavery to Egypt what does this mean that ancient slavery was not yoked to racial hierarchy. In other words, ancient slavery had nothing to do with race. Nothing to do with race. 
they had all to do with circumstances where people, uh, it, wasn't, it was common then for people to sell themselves into slavery. Matter of fact, we see this even in Genesis when uh, the people of God, uh, the people of Israel, were in Egypt, and, and even the Egyptians were in Egypt, where they had gone through the starvation and the, and the, the, the issues of, 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 of famine, they sold themselves into slavery. And so slave then were not, was a race base. It wasn't based on the color of your skin. It was based on economic conditions. It was based on the fact that I don't have any money, I'm in debt, let me sell myself into slavery for a period of time and I can work my way out of it, number one. So then, Slavery in scripture is not the same thing as what we see happen in the 16th, 17th, 18th century of our times. Number two, like I mentioned earlier, it was not uncommon for people to sell themselves into slavery as it represented a means of employment. And I think that's important for us to recognize. When we read the scripture and we see people that say, well, slaves obey your master. This was not the same kind of slavery. It was slaves, it was Employees and board, it was employees obey your employers. I think it's more like that than it was what we saw happen in our history. And number three, slavery was not a permanent status. It wasn't something that was permanent. Oftentimes, people could work themselves out of slavery. Matter of fact, for the people of Israel, they were not allowed to have slaves for too long. After seven years, you were, you were allowed to free them. And even in time of jubilee, you were told to free the slaves. God did not create laws and did not create a system where people were told they could enslave people for generations and generations and generations. No, that is not the kind of slavery we see in Scripture. And I think that's important then for us to recognize that every abuse we've seen of this. It's just that human beings are abusing it. It is not scriptural. And we all know that because of what we've seen happen in history, but I think it's important that we recognize this from a scriptural standpoint as an apologetic, as a way of refuting any kind of claim that says that the Bible endorsed it, that God endorsed it. If anything, when we look at Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 21, there were many rules and stipulations of how to make sure that you treat the slave well. You are not allowed to catch slaves. You are not allowed to kidnap them. You are not allowed to rape them. You are not allowed to abuse them. And you are not allowed to keep slaves for permanence. All of those laws, if anything, if looked at clearly, would have crept the transatlantic slave trade at its feet in a way where it would have never been able to have its footing in this country or in the West as a whole. So anyone who used the scriptures to justify it, used it just to abuse the scriptures for their own for their economic gain. With that said, it's important then that we recognize that even when it comes to the painful history of slavery, that God has always seen it, always seen what's going on. He's a sovereign God. And even though he may have allowed it to happen, it was never his intent and purpose. And we see that happen, even with Hagar, as you mentioned. Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, we see her narrative in Genesis chapter 16. An Egyptian woman, a woman of color. She is the first person in all of scripture to actually name God, the first person, a woman, a woman of color, who says, God, you are Jehovah El Roy, the God who sees me, the God who sees me. I don't know if that's a word for anyone here this morning. That God is a God who sees you, who's seen us, who's seen all of it. He's a God who sees. And by the way, Ishmael means a God who hears. The story was that after Abraham had done this, she's pregnant. Now she's pregnant. Now she feels her status a little bit more elevated. She begins to walk around like she's the boss in the house. And Sarah got irritated and kicked her out. 
hurried up fucking stuff out of my house. Abraham was upset about it, but as we men know, as they say in our culture, happy wife, had to let her go. But even as she was in the desert, almost dying from her thirst, God appeared to her in the, in the context of the angel of the Lord, in just Genesis chapter 16. And he appeared to her and he was able to have her go back to, her, to Abraham's house because he saw her, he heard her, so she goes back to this house, but eventually when she has Ishmael, there was more contention between her and Sarah, and eventually she had to leave altogether. But the Bible is clear that Hagar was seen by God and validated by God himself in an astonishing way. And so I want to extrapolate that to let it be clear and known then that from Hagar to Joseph, as we see here, by the way, and we'll see that after Joseph, Jacob and his descendants will move to Egypt, and the people of God themselves, the people of Israel, will be enslaved by the Egyptians. So from Hagar to Joseph to the people of Israel is a story of God's people. It's a story of emancipated slaves, a story of how God sees, God hears the people even in the trouble. The civil rights movement in this country would look to these moments, look to these stories, particularly stories of Israel, as they were oppressed by the Egyptians, enslaved by the Egyptians, as a means of strength and prayer and hope that a God who sees, a God who hears, and so for all of us who are seated here, no matter where you come from, whether you are an American descendant of slaves, as they now say, or you are African immigrant, if you will, or even if you're Caucasian American, no matter where we are in this hodgepodge, know that God is sovereign. God has always seen and heard what we've been dealing with, and God has always been in the business of emancipating and freeing people who are oppressed. When Jesus would come and announce his kingdom, he would come and say he's announcing the good news to the poor and to the bound and to the prisoners and to the who oppressed. And he has come to bring freedom to these people. Jesus himself would take on that status on our behalf. Philippians chapter 2, verses. Philippians chapter 2 is the, the text that we all know as we wrap up. Verses 5 to 8. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to the cross and died a criminal's death on the cross. So not only do we see that we have a God who sees, nor a God who hears, we have a God who came. He came in the person of Jesus, and he took on human flesh, and not to ascend to a throne, as we like to say. He took on the position of a slave. And we see him doing this even and the Oliver's discourse when uh, before the Passover, before his crucifixion, he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. He says, this is how, this is how you, this is what it means to be my disciple, that you, you love each other, you, you serve each other. Jesus is the ultimate one who comes on our behalf, takes on the position of a slave, of a servant, so that you and I can now be called sons and daughters. We saw earlier on in Joseph a son who became a slave. Eventually, we will see God work through Joseph and his sovereign plan to bring him back to prominence, to becoming a son again, and not only becoming a son, but becoming the prime minister of Egypt. But Jesus himself 
comes as a slave not to be elevated to the prime minister role, but to be elevated to a cross on our behalf. He didn't get the, the wonderful treatment. He didn't get the, the power, if you will. He lost power. He didn't get the royal treatment, if you will. He was crucified. Why? For you and I. He saw all the evil we've done to each other. He saw all the pain we've caused to each other. He saw us selling each other as slaves and, and abusing each other and manipulating each other and all of our jealousy and all of our envy and all of our hate. And he took it upon himself and he got nailed to the cross so he could bring us back together again. And the Bible says that when he comes again, he will run all his children up. As the Dr. King was saying, all of God's children, all of his black children, all of his white children, all of his children that are African, and all of his children that are African and the descendants of slaves, he's bringing us all back together. Sin broke us apart. But in Christ, he's bringing us together again. He took that on himself. He died a death that you and I deserved so that you and I could be reunited in life again. And, and body to a broken world, what it looks like. What the kingdom citizens, in their diversity, in their plurality, in their beauty, despite the different cultures, despite the different ethnic groups, despite the different languages spoken, the different racial tones, the different skin colors, we can be back together again. Why? Because of what Jesus had done. And history, when history ends, when he returns with his manifested rule and reign on the earth, we will see him bring us back together again. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful. We're so grateful, God, for your love for us, your grace for us, that despite our sin and our brokenness, despite our envy and our hate, despite our jealousy and our manipulation, despite the fact that we sell each other and we harm each other, you still loved us still. And you came to earth to pay the price of our sin and die the death that we deserve so that we can live the life that you lived and you deserve. Father, we ask that even as we go into the Lord's Supper this morning that you will unite our hearts, you will heal our divides, and you will bring a harmony and a reconciliation between all of your children. We ask for all these things in Jesus' name and amen. If you've been blessed by that, let's all go ahead and give God a hand clap. We want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. For more information on how to join the KC family, simply text the word LAUNCH to 281-699-0449. Again, that's LAUNCH to 281-699-0449.